Goethe's Faust is possibly the most famous work of literature in the world. Curiously, Goethe's lines could equally well apply to his close friend, 20 years his junior, the explorer, geographer, naturalist, scientist, writer and guiding light of the 19th century, Alexander von Humboldt. It's often said scientists can see further because they stood on the shoulders of giants. Humboldt saw further because on his travels he scrambled probably higher than any person had ever been before on the flanks of the South American volcano Chimborazo, and what he beheld changed his view of the world. I'm Roland Pease, and I've long known of Humboldt because of what Darwin wrote of him in later years. My admiration of his famous personal narrative, part of which I almost know by heart, determined me to travel in distant countries and led me to volunteer as naturalist in Her Majesty's ship, the Beagle. Because of that Darwin connection, I've always wanted to know more about Alexander von Humboldt, and the historian Andrea Wolfe has made that possible, a pleasure indeed, with her new biography, The Invention of Nature, which reveals Humboldt's extraordinary influence in the 19th century. A friend of princes and presidents, sought out by the world's scientists, an influence on poets, a changer of the world indeed. When Andrea Wolfe came into the Discovery Studio here at the BBC, I asked her first about Humboldt, Goethe and Faust. Goethe is writing Faust in bursts of activity and he didn't write Faust for a long time and then after Humboldt's first visit, he unpacks the manuscripts and starts again. So it's almost like this time with Humboldt, with his friend, inspired him to go back to this manuscript. And when you look at Humboldt as a character, as a personality, there is the same sense of restlessness, this, this unbelievable curiosity, this search for knowledge that is very much in the scholar Heinrich Faust. So Faust makes a pact with the devil for knowledge. And there's a bit of that in Humboldt. It's this sense of always wanting to know more about the world. This is late 18th century Germany. Near Berlin, he forms this extraordinary friendship as a young man with the older Goethe. I love that friendship because Goethe is 40 years his senior. He is the most celebrated poet in Germany at that time. He still is, but then he's, you know, he's the, he's like a godlike figure in Germany. And there's the young, energetic, restless Humboldt in his early 20s who arrives. And the fascinating thing about Goethe is, and not a lot of people actually know that, that Goethe was a really amazing scientist also. He was as interested in the sciences as he was in poetry and writing. So he meets Humboldt and he says that meeting Humboldt was like being woken up from hibernation. Suddenly he thinks about science again, they talk, they jump from one subject to another. So this, this is Humboldt's influence on Goethe, but it also works the other way around because Goethe is the one who inspires Humboldt to see the world differently. So Humboldt arrives very much believing in rational thought and reason and measurement and scientific instruments. And Goethe is the one who introduces him to this idea that we should use our feelings and our imagination to understand nature, which then becomes so important in Humboldt's concept of nature. And Humboldt says that Goethe has given me new eyes, new organs through which to see the world. So there's this two-way relationship, which is, I think, for both of them, incredibly important. But their encounters also seem to reveal something of Humboldt, the scientists, the experimentalists. They actually do experiments on electricity together. Yes, there are many wonderful scenes, but one of my favourite is it's a December 1794. It's one of the worst winters in decades, and the two men are trudging through the snow in Jena to the university to dissect people, to dissect animals, and then they do these electrical experiments where they take, for example a frog leg, they stick metals in there and chemicals. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to understand if there's some vital force in matter. Suddenly the leg jumps off the table and they get very excited. And Humboldt later says one of the most magical experiments I've ever done is because he realizes that he breathes on the leg and it's the drops, the moisture of his breath 
that then has a chemical reaction with one of the metals and that's what makes the leg jump off the table. But the core of his work wasn't in the labs, it wasn't in Germany. The core of his life was to make this extraordinary trip to South America and discover everything else flows from that. How did that come about? What what drove him to make that journey? So he goes in 1799 on a five years exploration through Latin America. And a lot of people have tried to work out why he wants to go. Um, I think one of the reasons is really his personality. It's a restlessness that is until he dies, just before he turns 90. And he himself says, I, you know, I feel as if I'm chased by 10,000 pigs. One of the reasons for that might also be that he was brought up in Prussia by a very emotionally cold mother. So he felt very restricted, even as a little boy, why his brother would escape into books, Alexander would escape into nature. So he would roam the estate, Tegel, where the family lived. So he would describe that nature was very soothing to his mind. He also had read the travel accounts, for example, of Captain Cook. So these, these kind of adventure stories as a boy, Louis de Bougainville. So he had read these expedition accounts and he wanted to see the world. And he goes out and he goes to places where very few white men had ever gone. And the extraordinary thing is that he actually doesn't go on a government or royal expedition. He finances everything himself, which makes him different to any of the other explorers because he can go wherever he wants to go. Totally independent. Totally independent. And he can criticise, he can change his mind and he doesn't travel with a huge entourage which makes him very flexible. And so he arrives in Venezuela just as a, an earthquake's about to happen. I mean, right from the start, it's, it's not just the science, there's the adventure in it all. He is brazenly adventurous. He is incredibly brave. I mean, I followed some of his footsteps and sometimes there's, for example, this moment where he describes, I mean, literally hanging off the crater of a volcano on this kind of tiny little ledge. And um, so we found that ledge and I was just like, this man is absolutely mad. I mean, he and, you know, there were like tremors. He's lying there. He's almost nauseous from the altitude sickness and he just carries on. So he does this thing. He arrives in Venezuela and they experience an earthquake. He describes it as the world he has known has stopped to exist. He suddenly realises that Earth, which is normally this kind of stable thing, moves. When a shock is felt, when the Earth is shaken on its old foundations, which we had deemed so stable, one instant is sufficient to destroy long illusions. It is like awakening from a dream, but a painful awakening, we feel that we have been deceived by the apparent calm of nature. We become attentive to the least noise. We mistrust for the first time a soil on which we had so long placed our feet with confidence. Because he really is one of the first to describe Earth as a living organism. And I think, you know, experiencing an earthquake might have led him more into that direction, for example. It's something that Charles Darwin, when he experiences his first earthquake, he actually goes to Humboldt's descriptions of that earthquake to describe his own That's so interesting. When I was reading your book, and I thought this is so similar to Charles Darwin arriving in Chile, and just as this earthquake's happening, and the, and the descriptions are very similar. An earthquake like this at once destroys the oldest associations. The world the very emblem of all that is solid, moves beneath our feet like a crust over a fluid. One second of time conveys to the mind a strange idea of insecurity, which hours of reflection would never create. It's similar because Darwin was so influenced by Humboldt. He, he read, in preparation of his trip, he read Humboldt's travel account of the expedition in Latin America, and actually Darwin has a set of Humboldt's books on a shelf next to his hammock on the Beagle. And amazingly, these books still exist in Cambridge and they are heavily annotated. So you can really see how Humboldt influenced Darwin's thinking. And I think it's the combination of scientific treatise combined with evocative landscape descriptions, which is very much a model that Darwin follows when he writes The Voyage of the Beagle. You talk about the evocative descriptions. There is pure poetry in some of these books. One of the things that surprised me the most is how beautiful 
Humboldt writes, and he also invents these wonderful terms. So one of my favorite is he invents a term for atmosphere, and he calls it Luftmeer, which means air ocean. He describes nature sometimes more like a poet rather than a scientist, and and no one had done that before. So it becomes very much a blueprint for nature writing, I think. It's very, when you look at a lot of nature writing today, to me it feels very much rooted in what he's doing, although it also influenced the romantic poets. So Wordsworth takes some of his descriptions from the Orinoco and almost uses them verbatim in his poems. Coleridge transcribes bits of Humboldt's books into his notebooks. So he's incredibly influencing them because his idea of nature as a living organism it almost becomes like a guiding metaphor for the Romantics, I suppose. You sort of imply that he is the first ecologist in that he doesn't look at plants or animals. He looks at ecosystems, what people would now call ecosystems, a combination of these. My argument is that he really comes up with this idea that nature is a web of life. So this concept of nature that still very much shapes our thinking today, because at a time when other scientists are very much looking through the narrow lens of classification. So if you are a botanist, you collect plants and you want to classify them and order them and make sense of nature. You describe the parts of them in minute detail. Exactly. And Humboldt is doing something very different. He's looking at plants in terms of where they grow, their habitat, but also their altitude, their climate. And he understands, because he travels through so much, so, I mean, like, you know, Venezuela to Cuba, Mexico, then back to South America, all the way down to Lima. So he sees a lot of different climates, but he's also traveled extensively in Europe. So what he realizes in Latin America is that many of the plants he's seeing in Latin America, he'd seen before in the Alps, in Switzerland, in the Pyrenees, in Spain. So, and he realizes that they're similar. So he understands that there are corresponding climate and vegetation zones across the world, which is something which is totally normal for us today. We know that there are vegetation zones across this globe. But he was the first to understand this. And he was also the first to understand that when you, for example, climbed a mountain, that the plants changed according to altitude. So he, he described that. He compared different mountains across the world to understand what's going on there. So he understands that everything hangs together. This is this web of life. And then, because he talks about almost nature as this tapestry of nature, he sees that if you pull one thread, you might unravel this whole tapestry. So he understands also that nature might be in danger. And that makes him, for me, the most extraordinary person, really, because he's the forgotten father of environmentalism, because he's the first to understand that humankind is about to destroy nature. And he said that more than 200 years ago. When forests are destroyed, as they are everywhere in America by the European planters, with an imprudent precipitation, the springs are entirely dried up or become less abundant. The beds of the rivers, remaining dry during a part of the year, are converted into torrents whenever great rains fall on the heights. The sward and moss disappearing with the brushwood from the sides of the mountains. The waters falling in rain are no longer impeded in their course, and instead of slowly augmenting the level of the rivers by progressive filtrations, they furrow during heavy showers the sides of the hills, bear down the loosened soil, and form those sudden inundations that devastate the country. So he warns in 1800 of harmful human-induced climate change. Because he talks about deforestation, the effects of deforestation, which is such a live issue in South America today. So he sees that monoculture and cash crops destroy the environment because trees, forests are felled to make space for, for the fields. Then with the disappearance of the undergrowth, heavy rains wash off the topsoil. He sees how water levels of lakes are falling because farmers divert the water to irrigate their fields. So he collects this material everywhere where he goes in his diary. He will, you know, he'll write like more forests destroyed. And later on in the 1830s, he says there are three ways in which humankind is affecting the climate through deforestation, through irrigation and through the great masses of steam in the industrial centres in 1832. So he's so prophetic, it's unbelievable. 
I want to conclude with an examination of how humankind affects the land. They do so through the destructions of forests, through the distribution of water, and through the production of great masses of steam and gas at the industrial centres. He talks about mankind's mischief, about how mankind might unhinge the balance of nature. He talks about in a future where they might travel to other planets, might turn those barren and ravaged as we've done with Earth already. So Humboldt describes, there's a wonderful scene where he's in um, Venezuela in the rainforest and every night he's woken up by the kind of nightly orchestra of animal screams and one night he begins to unpeel this chain of reaction and he hears the jaguars chasing the capybaras. Then the capybaras, as they run through the undergrowth, wake up the monkeys. The monkeys then wake up and scream. They wake up the birds. So Humboldt then says this whole commotion is a relentless, bloody battle in the animal world. And that's so much in contrast to the idea of the harmony of nature, I guess. The harmony is, comes out of some kind of cacophony of terror. The interesting thing is there are still people who describe Humboldt as the last one, because he dies a few months before the Origin of Species is published, as the last one who describes nature as this kind of harmonious whole, as this Eden where everything is kind of balanced. And it's absolutely not true. He does describe nature as unity, as a whole. He sees Earth as one living organism, but he also talks about the relentless bloody battle, uh, the contest for place and nourishment for plants and for animals. What I find fascinating about Humboldt is that he's not just a scientist, he's not just a nature writer, he's not just interested in measurements, he's interested in everything because what he sees is that we all live together on this earth. So the human species is as much part of this, politics is as much part of this. So he, for example, observes slavery, he, he's a lifelong abolitionist, he also is the first to link colonialism with environmental devastation. He sees colonialism as something that creates a system of injustice and dependency. He observes the environmental effect of mining, how mining kind of destroys the environment, but also sees the working conditions of the labourers there. He understands that this all belongs together. So he's arguing against colonialism, against cash crops. He's arguing for more sustainable agriculture. He talks... In Cuba, for example, he talks about this is an island full of sugar plantations, but they can't feed themselves. So it's just a very wrong way of doing agriculture. So he's interested in all these different aspects. And his political writings are quite important within his oeuvre. His political writing is incredibly important. He writes several books which attack Spanish rule in the colonies, which is quite extraordinary because the Spanish king gave him permission to travel there. But the beauty is because he's an independently wealthy man who can travel wherever he wants and he publishes his books himself. So he can do these very public attacks, which then becomes something that becomes very influential on Simon Bolivar, who's the man who liberates the Spanish colony. So the political books are incredibly important. They're in fact so important that when one of the books is translated in America. The publisher in America lives in the slave-owning South, and he just leaves out Humboldt's criticism of slavery. And Humboldt is absolutely furious when he sees that, and he writes an open letter to American newspapers saying, this is not an authorised translation, and the most important part of this book has been deleted. Extraordinarily passionate, and he did make a detour on his return at the end of that journey around South America to go and visit the President of the United States. And he's welcome there. I mean, this he's not some lone traveller. As you do, you think, like, oh, I'm just going like, to pop around and see the President of the United States. Yeah, he admired Thomas Jefferson very much for Jefferson's political ideas. He writes a letter from, from Philadelphia to Jefferson saying, like, hi, I have arrived and I bring all this amazing information and he's invited to Washington. Now, what you have to bear in mind is that the timing of this visit is absolutely perfect for Jefferson because Jefferson has just acquired the Louisiana Territory in the previous year, in 1803. This is the Midwest of America. Exactly. So suddenly the size of America has doubled and America has a new neighbour, which is Mexico. Now, Humboldt has just spent a year in Mexico and he spent a lot of time in the archives there. And Jefferson had tried 
desperately tried and um, through the Spanish ambassador to get some information through that channel and couldn't. So there's suddenly Humboldt who turns up and who just opens his bags and his notebooks and his maps and he just he briefs the president of the United States about the territory they had just acquired. You're saying in a sense, this European knew more about America's neighbours than the President of America did. Not just in a sense. He knew so much more. Gallatin, who was then the Secretary of um, Treasury, he wrote to his wife that they've received more information about Mexico than they even have about European countries because Humboldt was so meticulous. And one of the difficult things for Jefferson was that it was the disputed border of the Louisiana Territory. And basically, the whole of today's taxes was at stake. So Jefferson asked Humboldt, you know, what is there? Is it worth fighting for this bit of land? So it's just extraordinary. And Humboldt leaves him these very tightly written pages with all this information, which is still today in the Library of Congress, where you can see exactly what Jefferson asked him. We've talked about the contacts he made. You've talked about his role as the first environmentalist, the first ecologist, and we've talked about his influence on Darwin. How else does his influence then pervade 19th century science? How has what he done come down to us? I think what we have to bear in mind with Humboldt is he's not a discoverer. He's not someone, you know, who comes up with, you know, a universal law or discovers a continent or a river or something like that. That's not what it is about him. What it is is that he comes up with a view of the world, a holistic view of the world that still shapes our thinking today. And in that sense, Humboldt, in a way, becomes forgotten because his name is not attached to a big theory or universal law or a discovery. His influence is, is more holistic, I would say. Because I'm interested that so much of what you said, he, he sounds like a, a, a modern thinker. But on the other hand, you know, how easy is it to read Humboldt's works in his post-Enlightenment mindset and not to impose our own thoughts on it? Well, I think we have to be very careful. You know, I, I really don't like when people ask me, like, what would Humboldt do now doing this and this? I find that very problematic to kind of put my thoughts into a historical figure. What's important to bear in mind with Humboldt is that he is really the last of the polymaths and he dies in 1859 which is I would say very much the last moment where one person can hold all this knowledge in one head after that the science has become very specialized scientists become experts in a much more narrow field and that's why his influence on the scientists is not as obvious but I think that's why he is important again today because his interdisciplinary approach his kind of roaming across the disciplines makes him in our eyes a very modern scientist he shapes our way of thinking about nature if anyone listening to this program wants not only to read your book but would also like to go and read something original by Humboldt which of his many books would you say would be a good starting point I think there are two one is uh, views of nature which is a slim volume in which he describes nature really beautifully. And, they ha and he, at the end of each chapter, there are these a very, very long scientific notes, which I find some of them very interesting. But to get a sense of how he writes, you just need to read the chapters. And that's how he actually envisaged this book, that the general reader should just read the nature descriptions. And then um, the first volume of Cosmos, just the introduction, which is about 70 pages, which very much gives an idea of how he saw nature as this kind of living organism. This was his last work, The Grand Vision. It took him more than 20 years to write it, and it's this incredible book where he takes his readers on a journey from Earth to outer space, from the tiniest fleck of moss to the highest peaks of volcanoes. And it's a, it's a book that brings everything together. For me, it's really his declaration of love to nature in a way. Andrea Wolf, thank you so much for giving us such a wonderful exploration of Alexander von Humboldt's life here on Discovery on the BBC World Service. There's even more in your book, The Invention of Nature. And if anyone still doubts Humboldt's significance, I'll end with this endorsement from Charles Darwin. I believe from what I have seen, Humboldt's glorious descriptions are and will forever be unparalleled. 
I am at present fit only to read Humboldt. He, like another sun, illumines everything I behold. 